Beloved, I am pleased to bring you a message from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 11. Ten verses, verse 20 to 30. And I've entitled the message, The Holy Anger of God. The Holy Anger of God. I will be reading the entire text throughout the message, but... For now, I will read only two verses to start with. One of the verses is from the early part of the text, and the other is from the latter part. Let's look at verse 24. Verse 24 says, but, Jesus is talking, but I said to you 
that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the, in the day of judgment than for you. Wow. That's angry. That is angry. Jump down to verse 28 now. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now that's loving. Wow. Pray with me, Father. Speak now for your children are listening. And let this word transform all of us and conform us to the image of your dear son Jesus, in whose matchless name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The holy anger of God. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, what is the opposite of love? Is it anger? No, 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 no. It is hate. It is hate. But many people are confused about this. They imagine that if you get angry at someone, you're not showing love to them. But this is a big error. This is a big mistake. Sometimes the only way to express your love is through your anger. I know I have to explain this. At the end of this year, I will clock 36 years as a full-time pastor in this second. Very early in my ministry as a young pastor, one of the elderly members of the church called me aside. This person thought that I needed some counsel and direction as a young pastor. They were concerned that my sermon topics and scripture texts were going to run the people away and that I needed to be more positive. As I prepared this sermon, I thought to myself of that person, they certainly wouldn't approve of this topic, the holy anger of God. <laughs> but I don't decide on what I'm going to preach based on what people approve of. All I need to make sure that it is the word of God. This passage, in this passage we see both a loving and an angry Christ. <laughs> people generally have no problem when Christ is showing love. Like when he sits down with the, hate, with the hated rich like Zacchaeus or with the hated poor like the blind beggars or with the sexually marginalized like the woman at the well or even with little children. We like it when we see that. We generally like Christ when he is so incredibly approachable and so tender and so careful. Even in talking to very wicked, violent and oppressive people. Yet in the same passage, look here, in the same passage, we see Christ angry, pronouncing woes. Woe to you. The word woe speaks of a curse. This is Jesus putting a curse on three cities. <laughs> he was standing in judgment. And in the same passage, the same Jesus who is so angry, says in the latter part, Come to me, all you who are burdened, <laughs> labor. And are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And yet he says to Chorazin, Bethsaida and Capernaum. Woe to you. To Capernaum. He asks the question. Will you be lifted up to the skies? And he answers. No. You're going down to the depths. Same passage. He's angry. And yet he's loving. The problem here is to determine. How such great wrath. And it, of that intensity. <laughs> On the one hand, and such infinitely merciful love, on the other hand, could actually issue from the same heart at the same time. There are a lot of people who struggle mightily with this whole idea. They say, for instance, if God is a God of love, then he should not send people to hell. <laughs> if God is a God of judgment, he cannot possibly be a God of love. They have a problem reconciling the two things. Yet the Bible insists not only is God a God of both love and wrath. Not only do we see two things, these two things not actually in conflict with each other. 
But these two things actually establish each other. One without the other it makes nonsense. <laughs> if you try to extract God's wrath from his love, if you try to surgically remove or excise God's holy judgment from his mercy, you'll actually end up holding nothing at all. Therefore, I am here this morning to tell you that the God of the Bible is both a judge and a lover. Oh, I need somebody to help me. You heard me? He is both just and the justified. <laughs> He's both a fighter for his people and a savior. Both aspects of the divine person arise from the same source, his goodness. He's a judge because he's good and he's a savior because he is good. Have you ever tried to love somebody who is determined to destroy themselves? Have you? If you have, right, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. You're trying to love somebody who is trying to destroy themselves. Um, uh, you will know that the opposite of love is not anger. It is actually hate. For you would have figured out if you live long enough that a truly loving relationship is going to have some anger in it. Oh, you didn't hear me. <laughs> I said a truly loving relationship is going to have what? It's going to have anger in it. People who think if we love one another, there should never be anger are foolish people. It is because you love one another that very often the anger must be there. Because you're watching someone you love destroy themselves. Look, you're going to have to say something, you know. And you know, saying something is going to create trouble. But what you say? I love this person too much to watch them destroy themselves. I'm going to have to say what I have to say and what happened. Does anybody here even understand a little bit of what I just said a while ago? Yes. Huh? That very often when you really love someone, anger have to come up. Because you can't just watch them destroy themselves. <laughs> You're saying to yourself, how can I remove that self-destructive behavior? How can I remove the evil? How can I remove the delusion? How can I remove the bad habit without destroying the person? That is what you're thinking. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, the loving Jesus that we read of at the end of the passage and the angry Jesus that we read about at the beginning of the passage go together. We cannot have the sweet rest at the end of the passage without the disturbance at the beginning. Our Lord is a judge, but he is also a lover. They go together. They are meaningless apart from one another. <laughs> Our text gives us at least three facts about the anger, about the wrath of God. And they're very simple. Number one, the reality of God's anger. Number two, the rationale for God's anger. And number three, the remedy for God's anger. Are you all with me? This is very straightforward. The reality of God's anger, then the rationale for God's anger, and then the remedy for God's anger. Let's take them in order. Number one, the reality of God's anger. And... Um, we're reading verses 20 to 22 for this. Where it says, Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I said to you, <laughs> It will be more tol tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Wow. He's angry. He's angry. God's anger is real. <laughs> the idea of the judgment of God is largely rejected in the world today. There are plenty of people in our generation who do not reject the idea of God. But they reject the idea of a just and righteously angry God. Even though Psalm number 7 and verse 11 tells us that God is angry at the wicked when? Every, day. Every single day. Every single day. They reject the idea 
of a God who is looking at us all the time and weighing everything we do standing in judgment over us. That is generally rejected. Albert Ellis is a prominent psychologist of the past that many of the educators today like to quote. <laughs> a lot of them don't see how these ridiculous ideas sometimes influence the way they teach. <laughs> but he was known for something called rational emotive behavior therapy. And he actually said that all forms of religion, well, not all forms of religion, are psychologically unhealthy. But please don't get comfortable. <laughs> The kind that he thinks is psychologically unhealthy is what we would call devout faith. <laughs> Boy, this has encouraged a lot of people to reject the gospel, thinking that they're doing something nice, inciting Albert Ellis in their essays and dissertations. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank God for the Baptist Academy of Antigua. We reject, we, 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 we reject all of this kind of psycho bubble that they spout at the education colleges and departments in the universities in America and even in the University of the West Indies. <laughs> and Antigua State College. What Ellis meant by um, this devout faith being unhealthy is that he figured if you believe your Bible that God says don't do X, Y, and Z but deep down inside, you really want to do it. You feel like your flesh, your flesh, you want to do it. He says, if you follow God or your Bible, that is limiting your choices and your options. It's limiting your happiness. He says, that is psychologically too rigid and it is unhealthy. <laughs> what Ellis is calling unhealthy is what most of us have called forever to be responsible living. <laughs> That's what, what he called it unhealthy is what we know to be responsible living. Responsible living is when you love God and love people. Come on, talk to me. And wherever there is love, there is self-restraint. There is self-denial. That, that's what you do when you love people. You deny yourself for their good. This is how you love God. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself. Deny himself. Take up his cross daily. And this is what you do when you love people. You don't, you don't force your way. You don't have to have it your way. This is what you do when you love people. This stupid psychologist that many are listening to is saying self-restraint in a relationship of love is unhealthy. No wonder we're saying what we're saying today. To label self-denial in a relationship with God and other people as unhealthy shows you how deeply people are repulsed by the idea of a God who demands it. Wow. And a God who gets angry when you don't do it. When you don't deny yourself. When you're full of yourself. God comes and says, that is right. That is wrong. And listen to me. You better adjust yourself because there are serious eternal ramifications. They say, Tal, I don't like this God. Most people want to get rid of the idea of objective external standards by which they are judged. Most of secular thinking today resist that idea. Even the people who say they believe in God we like to say, you know, when we all die, we go to a better place. Every funeral in this country, every funeral in this country you go to, he's in a better place. She's in a better place. They're looking down on us right now. Listen to me. If you follow to all the churches in this country, nobody in hell, you know? <laughs> nobody in hell. Nobody's in hell. <laughs> but we know better. Because my Bible says, except you repent, what happened? You shall all likewise perish. <laughs> so, what the thing boils down to is that the idea of many people is that they decide for themselves if they're okay. There is no objective standard that's going to judge them. It is their decision as to what... But, but, but this runs right against both intellectual and emotional reality. Nobody can truly believe that. Because 
it is quite, well, even though it's quite popular and people pretend to believe it, it's a ridiculous and unplausible notion. The fact is that most of us actually do believe that there are things that are just wrong. Come on. Regardless of our publicly stated position. Many will say that biblical Christian values are based on a harsh judging God. They say, I believe in a God of love. I believe in a God who accepts everyone. Really? <laughs> they will say that until they run into a Hitler. Come on, man. People just chat them out, you know. Until they run into a really wicked... Somebody chop up one of your relatives and them. And what are you saying? I want justice! This is evil! Somebody abuse a little child sexually. He says, string them up! Some people are so ridiculous, they don't even want to wait for a trial. Because deep down inside, they don't believe what they're saying. They really do believe there is right and there is wrong. There is a God who will judge us. Why is it that people are afraid to die? Because they know viscerally there is a judgment. They have to come for their life. Why do people blame other people? Because they know. Why are you, why are you bother to blame somebody for unless there's going to be consequences? They know there's right and wrong. Why do people look for dirt on other people? There's <laughs> only one reason, you know. They're hoping that if they look really, really bad, that improves my, my position. <laughs> but it never works. It never works. Everyone believes viscerally that there is justice, there is God, there is a judgment. <laughs> and we know that in spite of our modern philosophies, <laughs> there is something higher than our hearts that will hold us accountable. It will hold us accountable what we do with our relationships, what we do with our sexuality, what we do with our tongue, what we do with the gifts and resources that we have. There is judgment. There is justice. There is a fair, impartial, pure set of eyes that's watching us and keeping records and will judge us. We know it viscerally. It is emotionally and intellectually incoherent to deny it. We need to stop pretending. We will all answer to God just like Chorazin and Bethsaida. You know, we may experiment all we want with psychological and philosophical theory. We may try to suppress our visceral expectation of judgment, but it will not go away. God is angry at our sin. We need to repent. We better repent before it's too late. Can't blame others. Make no sense. Look for dirt. There's no, no sense in being in contempt for God's order because no amount of protesting and remonstrance will change God's order. So let's stop pretending for God is immutable. He's the same yesterday, today, and when? Forever. Let's stop pretending for truth is what it is. So the exposure of the lie is inevitable. Let's stop pretending for new jargon and intellectual terminology will never sanitize what God calls foul, stinking sin. Let's stop pretending for what God has said. Let be sure your sin will what? what? We'll, we'll find you out. <laughs> Let's stop pretending for our sin cannot be absolved by any priest with all his movements. Let's stop pretending for our sin cannot be forgotten by chemical abuse. You can pull on the spliff all you want. You can drink as much rum as you want. The next morning will come and the sin and your trouble and your guilt is still there. Let's all stop pretending for there is no cover-up job to wash away the stains of sin save the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Will somebody give Jesus what only he deserves? Okay, that's the first thing. What's the first thing? The reality of God's anger. Now let's look at the rationale. The rationale for God's anger. And then we're going to look at verses 23. Going down to verse 27. He says, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, <laughs> it would have remained until this day. But I say to you, 
that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Wow! Y'all remember the story, right? Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember what God did to those cities? And Jesus is telling Capernaum, look, you're getting worse than that. Okay, let's continue. Verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. The rationale. The rationale for God's anger. Hmm. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, what our Lord Jesus says in verse 23 and 24 is a pretty amazing thing. First of all, Sodom is a pretty famous city in the Bible, but it is clear here that the rationale for it being judged is far more nuanced than many of you have thought. If you go to Genesis 18 and 19 where you see God judging the city, you will read there what many people know, because this is a fairly famous story that has come into our culture. Everybody knows what has happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Um, it's known for sexual immorality and licentiousness, particularly the sin of homosexuality. All right? Sodom and Gomorrah. As a matter of fact, it has come so much into the culture that we now call um, this sodomy. <laughs> okay? So everybody knows about that. And thinks about that sin when the matter comes up. This is indeed true. But it's not the whole truth. Because if you read Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 49. God said something else about Sodom. Let me read it. Look. This was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride. Fullness of food and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Sodom was not merely judged for sexual immorality, but also for social injustice. Wow. There are many people who are so concerned about sexual immorality that they care nothing about the plight of the poor. They will march. <laughs> and then there are others who march for the rights of the poor, but could, could not care less about the abomination of sexual immorality. Sodom was judged for both. Our Lord Jesus goes further and says, in effect, Sodom was judged on the basis of the law, on the basis of God's righteous standards, which were revealed in the Old Testament. But Capernaum, hmm, Capernaum has to deal with me and my presence. That's what he was saying. The fact of the matter is that our Lord's teaching and example gives us a moral vision of what we cannot find in any other religion or philosophy. This is unique to Christianity. Our Lord Jesus went to the Old Testament and he expounded and expanded it. He says in effect, and I'm trying to summarize here, okay? He says in effect, you've heard it said you shall not murder, but I said to you, you shouldn't even hate. By the way, only Jesus that, you know? Nobody else. <laughs> you shouldn't resent people. You've heard um, do not steal, but I said to you, don't even envy. Hmm. You must be content with what I give you. If you study Luke chapter 14, he says in effect, you have heard people say in the Old Testament, be hospitable. Have people in, share what you have. But I say to you, do not invite people into your home who can invite you back. Oh my, look, Jesus spoiled up everything. You thought you were doing good. <laughs> invite the poor, invite the homeless, invite the maim, invite the people in, share your goods with them, and don't expect them to invite you back because they don't have anything. Wow. <laughs> we thought we were doing well until Jesus speaks and shows us that our interpretations are shallow to the core. <laughs> you remember, um, he said, um, 
you've heard love your neighbor, but I said to you what? Love your enemy. What? You, you mean the, the man who just tried to kill me the other day? What is this? Only Jesus starts like that. Only Jesus? This is the only true religion. Only Jesus talks like that. <laughs> Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Only Jesus. Everybody else says otherwise. When you listen to that kind of teaching, you're tempted, well, you have to say, I agree with Jesus. That's the way the world should be. That's the way human beings should live with one another. We, we catch the moral vision. No one in history except the Lord Jesus Christ has even thought about ideals like these. Nobody else. But here's the problem. The second, the instant that we begin to admire what our Lord is saying about human beings or how they ought to live with one another, then suddenly we've realized we're doomed because we realize we're not even close to that. Come on. You have been happy with yourself that you haven't killed anybody. But boy, you have killed them mentally. You have hated them. You have wished that they disappear. Hmm? You may not have been involved physically with someone sexually, but man, you fantasize about it all the time and you want it to happen so badly if you could only figure out how to get, get away with it. Some are actually secretly involved with it. Hmm? <laughs> but Jesus has raised the standard. He says, it is not just your outward behavior. That is egregious. Your outward behavior is egregious. But even your inward motivations and commitments, are, you go to hell for that too. Wow. The basic problem here is that we all know we deserve judgment. I, didn't, I, 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 I don't, don't know if you got that. I said deep down inside, what, what do we all know? We deserve judgment. Just look at the trouble in our lives. Look at the depression. Look at the anxiety. Look at the self-consciousness. We are having problems because deep down inside, we know we deserve judgment. All of us know we deserve judgment. There is justice in the world. There is one higher than us. And he is watching and he will judge. Listen, if you have never before felt that you deserve to be judged by God, you don't know what Christianity is about. <laughs> you missed it. It went over your head. If you do not feel that way, if you do not ever stand and say, look at me, I have no claim for God's love. I have no claim for his love. I have no reason to, become, to complain. I have spent so much time complaining about my life. I don't really have a reason because what? If he should judge iniquity, who can stand? Not certainly not me. If you never talk like that, you, you don't understand Christianity. You don't know anything about Jesus. Everything went over your head. Listen, people who have truly encountered Christ in their hearts will realize that they have no claim on him at all. No reason to demand his love. No reason why uh, they, they should say that he's not fair. <laughs> Please, I tell you, when you come to God, do not ever ask for justice. Because justice will put you in hell. Beg mercy. Beg mercy. But when I look at this Jesus and know that he knows everything. My brother, you know he knows everything, right? The things that the rest of the people don't know. He knows it all. When I look at the fact that my Lord has never missed anything about me. Come on. Will somebody say full surveillance? He has watched everything I've done. He has seen it all. He knows it. And yet... I'm hearing him say, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Have you ever heard of more extravagant grace in your life? Isn't that marvelous? How could he say that knowing all that? Lord, our Lord tells us that he is the judge who was judged. That's why it's possible. Oh, you didn't hear me. What is he? The judge who was judged. That means that he is just and still what? Yes. 
the justifier of those who believe in him. You see, on the cross, both the justice of God and the love of God are perfectly brought together. When Jesus died on the cross, that event was perfect satisfaction of divine justice. And so all of our shortcomings, all of our flaws, all of our difficulties are released because Jesus took them on himself. <laughs> you know Amos chapter 5 and verse 24. Huh? What does he say there? <laughs> but let justice what? Run down like waters and what? Righteousness like a mighty stream. That was happening in Jesus at the cross where I first saw the light. <laughs> and the burden of my heart what? It was there. By grace, I receive my sight. If you're happy, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You're not just learning what you ought to be. You're learning that he was that for you. When we understand this, we will see that every other religion says what? Strive for more understanding. Strive for more effort. More, more work. More work. More work. You, you need to do better. 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 If you're going to make it in. But Jesus is saying, come on, man. Come to me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. And guess what? I will give you rest. You know why? Because I'm going to work for you. My active and passive obedience will be sufficient to cover you. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Please understand this. If we believe that we have a claim on God's love, that love will never transform us. It will just make us more arrogant. More and more arrogant. <laughs> we will ask him, what have you done for me lately? Because what well, we think we're all that. We have this entitlement mentality. All right? The people whose lives are revolutionized. The people who have changed the world for righteousness and have taken the world by the throat. The people who end up with courageous faith and genuine joy are the people who first understand that they have no claim on God. None. I could never say he's unfair because if he's fair, I'm gone. I have no claim on God. None whatsoever. <laughs> That's how the rest comes because the rest comes because Jesus paid it all. All. I need a witness. All. To him I owe. Sin. I left the crimson stain by what? What did he do? What did he do? Oh, give the Lord some praise. He didn't say go wash it. Because I would want to know what. With what? Horror wash. Dirty clothes. In dirty water. How can I wash filth with dirt? Lord have mercy. But I know that the precious blood of Jesus. Will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <laughs> there is rest for us brethren. Because of the work of Christ. <laughs> and even though we are accountable to him. He does not change his standard. He does not change his, his, his righteousness. He simply pays it for us. Oh, what a savior, what a savior, what a savior. Ah, oh, I am grateful today because I know what I deserve. Does anybody else know what they deserve? And I know what I'm getting. I know what I'm getting. And I know I shouldn't get it. Oh, come on now. I said I know what I deserve and I also know what I'm getting. And I know that I have no right to what I'm getting. I don't know about you, but I'm happy right now. Anybody else happy right now? I, I didn't ask you if you like everything that's going on. But, but basically, your happiness is going to come down to the fact that your account, the old account, was settled long ago. I'm happy right now. <laughs> I'm so happy. My eyes were open to the emptiness of my cries for justice. For justice would have ruined me to death and eternal perdition. I'm so happy that the fiery coals of magnanimous mercy cleanse my foul and filthy mouth, turning my profanity into doxology. <laughs> I'm happy that the, 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 the light of extravagant grace removed the darkness 
of my victim mentality and expose the folly of my sense of entitlement. <laughs> I'm so happy that God's just anger, which should have exposed me to the full brunt of his righteous indignation, was met with his forbearance and his loving kindness. I'm so happy that Jesus lifted me. That's why I'm singing glory. Hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. I told you about what? The reality of God's anger then. The rationale for God's anger. Let's look at the remedy for God's anger. The remedy for God's anger. We're looking at now verses 28 through 30 where Jesus said what? These sweet words. What he said? Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is what? Easy. Easy. And my burden is what? Light. Viscerally, we all believe in justice. We believe in it so much that if we foolishly dismiss the notion that there is a God who administers it, we apply for and appoint ourselves as the judge. Because what? We know they have to be a judge. <laughs> Without judgment, there is no rest for nobody will be able to confirm that they are forgiven. Whenever we have a hard time resting, we are also having a hard time forgiving other people. How do we escape the judgment of God? How do we escape this mess? Well, it comes down to something simple enough. Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, what did they fail to do? They failed to repent. It's as simple as that. Do you even know what repentance is? No, I could give you a technical definition. But I'll try to keep it simple. Repentant persons start to honestly question the whole basis of their life. They realize, look, I got this whole thing wrong, you know. Everything that I've been trying to get this rest hasn't worked. I've become more restless. Hmm. They admit it. You know, some people have a hard time because of their pride admitting it. That everything they've been trying to get themselves some rest in life really just made them more restless. But repentant people call the spade the spade. I'm restless. Nothing works. Everything is overrated. Everything that I've tried to give me peace in my heart and just made me more miserable. I need something, something lasting. <laughs> you know, um, parents who raise children <laughs> to trust Jesus, grew up in the church, are often disillusioned when they find out that their children are just cultural Christians, not biblical ones. It's a shock. Because you say to yourself, but I have raised these children to trust Jesus, to trust in the blood, put, to stake, put all their chips on Calvary. And look here, why are they behaving like that? How can they just turn like that? We're shocked. We're shocked. <laughs> there are three big idols in the culture that take out our young people. Three. Three big, big idols in our culture that take out our young people. Professional status, material comfort, and physical attractiveness. Professional status, material comfort, and physical attractiveness. They decide, look, uh -huh. tall. They have that over here, and on the other side is the cross of Christ. <laughs> they say, ah, leave that for mommy and them. Hmm? No, 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 finish with that. When do we usually find out that they finish with it? When decision-making time comes. Now, when they live in your house, okay, they behave themselves. But then when <laughs> they become of age and start to assert themselves, you find out that the cross doesn't mean anything to them. It was a lie. They were lying. They have settled for the cultural idols. Professional status. Material comfort and physical attractiveness. That's what they're banking on. And so, pretty soon they're gone. Some don't just go. They pretend to the end that they care about the cross. 
And of course, the church is not going to change. So they just create ruckus in the church until they have to go. Hmm? Trouble. It, it, it never ceases to amaze me. As I said, in, in next month, it'll be 36 years here. And I've watched it repeated over and over, decade after decade. Hmm? Some come of age, and then we start to find out what's really going on. And then they come and they expect the church to adjust to it. Huh? We stick to the word of God. We don't deviate to the right or to the left. We can't change anything for you. Sorry. Sorry. And then we find out what's really going on. <laughs> Some will leave graciously, but they'll never find rest. <laughs> they move from bad to worse. It's just a downward spiral, and you sit there, and you still love them, you know. You still love them. Because <laughs> let me tell you something. I don't know about you, I know, but I can't stop loving who I've been loving all along. I really can't. I can't. I still love all of them, even no matter how badly they behave. And I'm, I'm watching what's going on, and I'm saying, oh, my goodness, that one was a fake, too. That one, yeah? Oh, my goodness. Oh, God. And I pray a lot. I pray a lot. I call a lot of these names. Pray that God will change them and bring them back. Hmm? But let me tell you something. They will never find rest. But we know we can find rest in one place. We can find rest in Jesus. For there is therefore what? Now, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. We can rest in Jesus. For we don't have to judge anybody anymore because the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and on the good. We can rest in Jesus. For if we are in Christ, we are new creatures. All things are what? Passed away. away. Behold, all things are what? Become new. We can rest in Jesus. For we can forgive because we have been forgiven. And we know that if even when people come to us in different ships of experience, we all are in the same leaky boat so we can forgive them. <laughs> Hello, we can rest in Jesus because I heard and proved that every day with Jesus can be sweeter than the day before. Does anybody here know what I'm talking about? You see, it's sweeter. Not because it's pain free, but because we're honored to be partakers in Christ's suffering. <laughs> sweeter not because it's a devil free zone but because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world it's sweeter not because we're strong but because God's grace is sufficient for us and his strength is made perfect in our weakness it's sweeter not because we're consistent but because Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever it's sweeter not because of smiling providences but because we have learned that even in the frowning provinces we will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually be in our mouth it's sweeter not because we are sinless but because we have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous hallelujah hallelujah to the Lamb of God we can rest because Jesus is sweet. He's the sweetest name I know. Yes. I heard that he's just the same. Yes, well, does anybody know what I'm talking about? I heard that he's just the same. What? As his lovely name. And that's the reason why I love him so why? Jesus is the sweetest name I know. My sinful nature, covered. My sinful record, covered. <laughs> My remaining corruption, covered. <laughs> Uh, my constant need for guidance uh, covered uh, my restful inheritance in glory uh, covered don't you want that kind of rest that's why he said come on to me all ye the labor and are heavy laden and what i will give you rest hallelujah to the lamb amen